Good afternoon, church. Let's have a word of prayer. Eternal God and most gracious Father in heaven, once again, we are thankful to be here. Father, we are thankful that you have uh, poured out your spirit upon us and given us the ability to meet like this and to preach your gospel. Lord, I'm asking now that you would anoint my lips and that you would open the hearts and the minds of those who are here. Father, I thank you that we can come to the throne of grace boldly because of what Christ has done. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So in my previous message, I spoke a little bit about preparation that was needed and how we needed to prepare our hearts for that time that's coming, the close of probation, when our cases will be presented before God. I want to continue on the theme of preparation and what we need to do to self-prepared or to prepare ourselves. The word of God is very direct in what we need to do as far as Christians, how we should live, how we should treat others. And there are times when I feel as if we take the word of God for granted. There are times when I feel that we can use God's word as a weapon. But here's the thing. As I said in my previous, one of my previous messages, true transformation of the heart is necessary. It is something that is very necessary in order for us to meet the bar of God. And that begins by looking at self, right? Self-examination is very critical. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, this is what it says. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, as Christians, as people in general, it's very easy for us to look at others, right? It's very easy for us to look at someone else and sum someone else up before we've even done it to ourselves. Right? In Acts of the Apostles, page 87, paragraph 2 and paragraph 1, this is what it says. It says the early church was made up of many classes of people, of various nationalities. At the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Among those of the Hebrew faith who were gathered at Jerusalem were some commonly known as Grecians. 
between whom the Jews of Philistine, there had long existed distrust and even antagonism. The hearts of those who had been converted under the labors of the apostles were softened and united by Christian love. Despite former prejudices, all were in harmony with one another. Satan knew that so long as this union continued to exist, he would be powerless to check the progress of gospel truth. And he sought to take advantage of former habits of thought in the hope that thereby he might be able to introduce into the church elements of disunion. Thus it came to pass that as disciples were multiplied, the enemy succeeded in arousing the suspicious of some who had formerly been in the habit of looking with jealousy on their brethren in the faith and of finding fault with their spiritual leaders. And so there arose murmuring of those Grecians against the Hebrews. The cause of complaint was an alleged neglect of the Greek widows in the daily distribution of assistance. Any inequality would have been contrary to the spirit of the gospel. Yet Satan had succeeded in arousing suspicion. Prompting measures must now be taken to remove all occasion for dissatisfaction, lest the enemy triumph in his efforts to bring about division among the believers. What this quote is telling me is that the enemy sees our goal. He sees our goal to be unified. He sees our goal to be in harmony with one another, to be in fellowship and love one toward another. And what his greatest desire is, is to sow disunion between us. And the way he's going to do that is by having each and every one of us with an outward view instead of an inward view. What the enemy desires is that we find fault outside of ourselves so that we could prevent the work that's being done inside of ourselves. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30, this is what it says. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed what kind of seed? Good. Which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth food, fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then has it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said what? Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both, what? Grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn. But gather the wheat into my barn. Let me ask you a question, brethren. Whose job is it 
to uproot the tares? That's not ours, is it? What job do we have? We have the job of preaching the gospel. We have the job of loving our neighbor, right? The job of uprooting tares is not ours. In 5 LTMS, letter 19, 1897, paragraph 9, listen to what it says. When Christians accuse and condemn their brethren, they show themselves to be in service of the accuser of the brethren. When they talk of the faults and failings of others, they plant roots of bitterness whereby many may be defiled. It is through this kind of work that brother becomes suspicious of brother. Confidence is unsettled and variance arises in the churches. Love cannot exist where the conversation is largely upon the errors and mistakes of others. Can I repeat that? Love cannot exist where the conversation is largely upon the errors and mistakes of others. Jesus said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Let me tell you, we have enough work to do in and of ourselves than to try to do a work for somebody else. The words of Christ are thus treated with contempt as though frail, erring man had found some other way to heaven than that appointed by the Lord, the path of obedience to his commandments. We all hope to reach the same home in heaven. But if Christ is not formed within, if you have not the mind of Christ, and do not practice the words of Christ, if you are fully satisfied with your own peculiar ways, so that you feel justified in complaining of your brethren, you will never reach heaven. Did you hear that? You will never reach heaven. God is the one doing the work. And once we try to take over the job of the Holy Spirit in someone else's life, we are entering an employment that is above our pay grade. Amen? We are to preach the word. The job of convic convicting the person is not on us. God is trying to do a work in us. And if we be Christians, there is one hope that we have. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If we all believe that we are Christians, we all know that there is a Christ performing a work in us. And believe me when I tell you this, we all may not be on the same path, right? Different plants grow at different rates. However, 
in their growth, as long as they're going up, there's hope. But here's the thing. Don't try to look on the outward appearance and judge someone else. Because the word of God tells us man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Think about this. How upset was Lucifer to find out that he could not claim the body of Moses? He wrestled for that soul because what he saw was the outward appearance. He saw him being given a strict command. He saw the disobedience of that command, but he did not see the heart of Moses. Ezekiel chapter 33, reading verse 30, uh, verse 7 to 9, this is what it says. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a what? A watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and do what? Warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to what? Warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Let me point something out in verse 7. He has said, I have set thee as a what? A watchman, not a henchman. Do you understand the difference? I have set thee as a watchman. If you know within yourself you have done all to warn, leave the results with God. Once again, it is not us who convicts the soul. Listen to this here. In Christ Object Lessons, page 71 in paragraph 2. Christ's servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in the church. They long to do something to cleanse the church, like the servants of the householder. They are ready to uproot the tares. But Christ says to them, what? Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Imagine, imagine what damage we could do if we start imposing our convictions on others. I, I shared with you guys that from time to time, I minister to a Sunday church. 
And I love this church. I really do. But imagine if I came in one morning and said, hey, look, this church needs reform. And I just started pointing out everything that I would like to see change. How many souls do you think I would win? Not a single one. Not a single soul. It was in a group of believers that myself and my wife experienced the most critical judgment. We were new to the Adventist faith. We came to church desiring a change for our lives. But we came just as we were. At that time, I had my pants sagging. I had earrings in my ears. I had a hat on my head walking into the church, gold chain around my neck. I came to God and I said, hey, look, I need help. And I had some people come up to me who thought they were doing wonders for the work of Christ. came and sat next to my wife and said, hey, um, your dress is a little short, isn't it? Your heels are a little high, aren't they? You came to church like that? My wife was shocked. The church is a hospital and people are appalled when they see sick people. Did you hear that? The church is a hospital. It's full of people trying to be made well. And people are appalled when they see sick people enter the hospital. There is a desperate change that's needed in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we have enough problems of our own. Too many to be looking at someone else saying, hey, look, you need help. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those who we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. You know, the life that I came from, Everyone who knows me from my past would tell you they would never expect me to be here. In fact, if you would have asked me if I saw myself here, oh man, I would have thought you were taking some Kenyan drugs. Understand, Christ is calling the weakest. Because his strength is made perfect in weakness. He chose little children to lead nations.
We are to deal with these souls according to our imperfect judgment. No, were we to deal with this these souls according to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. Many who think themselves Christians will be at last found wanting. Many will be in heaven who their neighbors suppose would never enter there. Believe me when I tell you this. When I felt the condemnation of the so-called people of God, I almost wanted to walk out of that place. I said to myself, this can't be true. This cannot be God's people. Man judges from the appearance, but God judges the heart. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. There's a work being done in each and every one of us. Right? So our job is not to condemn our brother. Our job is to lift them up. To give them hope. Hey, look, brother. Hey, look, sister. I struggled with the same thing. Is there any way I can help? Isn't that what Christ would do? And we're telling ourselves we're people of God. We're children of God. Oh, we need to act like it. Just like my brother said, we've, we've got the truth intellectually. Do we have it spiritually? Pray that God does a work in us as individuals before we pray for ourselves collectively. We need an individual work. There is in the Savior's word another lesson, a lesson of wonderful forbearance and tender love. As the tares have their roots closely intertwined with those of the good grain, so false brethren in the church may be closely linked with true disciples. The real character of these pretended believers is not fully manifested. Were they to be separated from the church, others might be caused to stumble. Who but for this would have remained steadfast. Think about this. If God decided you know what, Lucifer? You messed up. You, you messed up. You're done. What if God would have responded in that manner? What do you think would have happened? Exactly. There would have been an even greater rebellion. This is supposed to be the God of love. Where was the love? Where was the forbearance? Where was the patience? If God is so loving, so patient, so kind, that he would forbear with Lucifer this long, how much more we should be loving, patient, and kind with our brother? In present truth, May 12th, 1898, pages 295, paragraph 2, this is what it says. The law of God is love. 
His commandments are not grievous. Therefore, there can be nothing of harshness in the work of reclaiming an erring one. If you are trying to win someone back to Christ, who you believe is stumbling, there can be nothing of harshness. If thy brother sin, go show him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. The object of showing a brother his fault is to gain him, to restore him, not to condemn him. The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. Do we understand that? The Holy Spirit convicts of sin. But only as the comforter. The Spirit of God does not convict to condemn. Whoever attempts this delicate work is to go in the spirit and meekness, which is the spirit of Christ, who is meek and lowly in heart. He is to go simply as Christ's representative, as the agent whom the spirit of Christ uses. There's two ways that the Spirit is used in the Bible. Agent and agency. Sometimes we get to thinking that we're the agency instead of the agent. Sometimes we think we're the ones that use the Spirit instead of letting the Spirit use us. And with that mentality, believe me when I tell you this, we're wielding a weapon. It's going to cause more harm than good. The words that he speaks are to be Christ's words and not his own. It is to be Christ that goes and nobody else. Then, Whatever be the result, the work will have been done right. Not every time you go and try to win your brother to Christ, will they listen? Am I right? But here's the thing. If they don't listen, it's not your job to make them listen. Leave the results with God. But let us beware of putting ourselves in Christ's place. We are not to do something and then comfort ourselves or defend ourselves with the statement that we have done as he would have done. The work is God's work. And he must be allowed to do it in us. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Actually, let's go to verse 5. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is our job as Christians to be burden bearers not the creator of burdens. 
Am I right? And I can't tell you how many times, how many times I've encountered a sad situation where a brother or a sister comes up to me and says, oh man, sister so-and-so is here and I just, I can't, I can't do it today. She's always condemning me. And all I want to do is just love her. I can't tell you how many times. That is dissension. And there is only one who desires that for us. We need to be drawing near to each other, especially in this time. We need to be drawing closer to each other in love. Because love is the only way that we are going to win souls. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Guys, I'm here to help anybody that needs help. If there's a brother or sister who's struggling with something and you want to talk, I'm here. If you have something that you need help with, I am here. But please, please, don't come to me and say, fix that person. Because the only thing I'm going to ask is, well, what about you? Is there anything that you need fixing? That outward view that we have needs to stop. We need to get more internal. Search ourselves out. Because in this time, this preparation time, we know one thing. We are living in the antitypical day of atonement. And the children of Israel had to afflict their souls before God. This work couldn't have been done for another. So that self-examination is needed. Because when we stand before the bar of God, we won't be able to say, but he... She, we will stand to take account for our actions alone. In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 489, paragraph one and two. Pay attention to this, please. If we have a sense of the long suffering of God towards us, we shall not be found judging or accusing others. Brothers and sisters, I am so glad that God is so patient with me because there are times when I'm hard headed. I can't stand before you saying that I'm perfect. But I can stand before you and say that Christ is doing a perfect work in me. And each and every day, I'm going to wake up and yield myself to Christ.
I may stumble and fall, but I'm going to get right back up. When Christ was living on the earth, how surprised his associates would have been if after becoming acquainted with him, they had heard him speak one word of accusation, of fault finding, of impatience. Let us never forget that those who love him are to represent him in character. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another, not rending, rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. Once again, we don't know how much time is left in this world. And the work of love needs to move, spread like wildfire. The prophet says the last message to go to this world is a revelation of the character of God. And that character of God needs to be lived out in us. There's no other way for the world to see it. We are the vindicators of God. God has chosen this worthless being you see standing in front of you to represent him. He has chosen you to represent him. If we are unfaithful in that work, we only bring reproach to the name of God before the world. If the work of God was done in us effectively, there wouldn't be a single atheist. The greatest harm to the work of God is an unloving and unlovable Christian. God desires his love to be lived out through us. But first, we've, we have to experience it. We have to become acquainted with what love is in order for us to give it. Notice this. Earnest workers have no time for dwelling upon the faults of others. We cannot afford to live on the husks of others, faults or failings. Evil speaking is a twofold curse. You hear that? Falling more heavily upon the speaker than upon the hearer. He who scatters the seeds of dissension and strife reaps his own, in his own soul, the deadly fruits. The very act of looking for evil in others develops evil in the one, in those who look. By dwelling upon the faults of others, we are changed into the same image. You see how that works? By beholding, we become changed. By beholding Jesus, talking of his love and perfection of character, we become changed into his image.
there was one day that I was in the denominational church and there was a group of people that came in and I didn't know this group of people, but they came in, they walked to the door with, you know, smiling faces. And I said, Hey, good morning. Happy Sabbath. And there was a lady that rushed past me to the door. And she screamed, you are not welcome here. I was shocked. I was shocked. So I, I pulled this sister to the side and I said, hey, sister, what is, what's going on? She says, well, I remember that man from a long time ago. And he's a, um, a Branch Davidian. She said, so, so all of them has to be Branch Davidians. And they're coming to trying to change our church. I said, well, okay. Um, what if they're coming in to be saved? She said, oh, no. And I said, sister, let me ask you a question. If it was a group of Catholics, would you have done the same thing? If it was a group of Baptists, would you have done the same thing? I said, you threw out judgment and all they did was walk and smile. These gentlemen came in, they sat down and one of them said, I'm no longer a Branch Davidian. And I'm just like, you see the damage? You see the damage? It's not our job. It's not our job to pass judgment on people, especially, especially when we ourselves may not be right with God. Speaking of Jesus, by contemplating the lofty ideal he has placed before us, we shall be uplifted into a pure and holy atmosphere, even the presence of God. When we abide here, there goes forth from us a light that irradiates all who are connected with us. Instead of criticizing and condemning others, say, I must work out my own salvation. If I cooperate with him who desires to save my soul, I must watch myself diligently. I must put away every evil from my life. I must overcome every fault. I must become a new creature in Christ. You see, there's a good way of saying I, right? And there's a bad way to say I. I like this way of saying I. I like placing the focus on myself. In my relationship with God, I want him to change me. Not saying that I don't care about you, brothers and sisters. But I've got problems. And I feel like God has his hands full with me. So I need to be internally focused. It's me who needs to be on my knees every day asking for grace and mercy. I don't need to be on my knees saying, thank God I'm not like them. Right? I need to experience the love of God. 
Ministry of Healing, page 493, paragraph 2 and 3. Till the end of time, there will be tares among the wheat. When the servants of the householder, in their zeal for his honor, ask permission to uproot the tares, the master said, Nay, lest while gathering up the tares, ye root up the wheat also, or root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. In his mercy and long suffering, God bears patiently with the perverse and even the false hearted. Among Christ's chosen apostles was Judas the traitor. Should it then be a cause of surprise or discouragement that there are fa false hearted ones among his workers today? If he who reads the heart could bear with him who he knew was to be his betrayer, with what patience should we bear with those at fault? Think about this. Judas was so close to Jesus. And Jesus knew exactly who Judas was. But did Jesus ever speak a word of contempt to Judas? All he did was love him. Love is the fulfilling of the law. In closing, I want to read John chapter 12 and verse 26. John chapter 12 and verse 26 says this. If any man serve me, let him follow who? Him. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Our goal is to have our relationships centered in Christ, that no matter what, no matter where, we are following him. It is his character that we should be reflecting to the world, and it is his character that the world should see. Anything less than that would do injustice to God. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, Lord, we are thankful. We are thankful that we can come to the throne of grace and mercy boldly. Father, we are thankful that you have employed your son to do a work in us and that he will see it through to the end. Father, I pray if there be any sin or fault among us that you would forgive us according to your loving kindness, according to your patience and your mercy, please forgive us, Lord. If we have been judgmental in any way, if we have been critical in any way, Lord, please let mercy and grace and grace abound. Father God, we are all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And we pray, Lord, that the body of believers would be a hospital to the sick. That when people come to us, that they would receive of you. Lord, I pray that in these last days, we may glorify you in this world. Help us to reflect your character and reflect it fully so that we may see the coming of our Lord in Jesus' name, amen.